Hey, gang, this episode of WTF is sponsored by Stamps.com. Go to Stamps.com and type in WTF when you click the radio microphone to start a no-risk trial and get a $110 bonus offer. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. Do it up. Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. Pow! What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fuck, Nicks? What the fuck, Nucks? What the fuck, Ricans? What the fuck, Amalins? Uh, what the fuckstables? What the fuck, Adelics? What the fucking fuck? Fuck yes. Oh, shit, fuck, yes. God damn right. Oh, fucking hell. I'm sorry, I just read this article about cussing, and I just want to keep fucking doing it because apparently it's not bad for me. I'll get to that in just a second. I'd like to tell you right now at the beginning of the show, I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. I appreciate uh, you listening to my show, and today I'm very excited because I have Norm McDonald on the show. Now, i got to be honest with you. I've not spoken to Norm hardly at all in my life i have a weird memory of norm not weird but it's what's odd to me is as i talk to people in my profession who i've kind of known for a long time just by virtue of us being in the same profession it's interesting where our paths meet and the memories that i have i don't know why i'm talking like this i apologize but it's going to be very interesting because i definitely have you know, a certain way that I think Norm is. I, I like Norm. I think he's funny. But I, I have an idea of who that guy is. So I'm, uh, I'm very excited to talk to him. Now, I would like to say this. I want, I don't promote myself enough. I do promote things on this show, but I tend to forget that, uh, I have shows coming up. We actually have a live WTF coming up at the Steve Allen Theater here in Los Angeles, October 25th. Interesting show. Uh, I'm going to have Josh Molina on. I'm going to have uh, Jonah Ray on. I'm going to have uh, Maron Vio Vance on. I'm going to have this guy, Steve Mazan, uh, who made a movie about getting cancer and uh, trying to get on Letterman. And fucking Mojo Nixon. Mojo Nixon. I got in touch with Mojo Nixon. I, you know, someone suggested it. I thought, like, shit, yes. I love Skid and Mojo. Let's see what Mojo Nixon's up to. So he said he's going to come up. He said bring a guitar. He'll make something up. That'll be good. Eddie Pepitone, Jim Earl, of course, on that live show on the 25th. And for you Bay Area people or people who want to make the trip to the Bay Area, San Francisco Punchline, I will be appearing November 2nd through 5th. And then the big show in Seattle. Very excited about this. It's uh, really my first uh, small theater show, Neptune Theater, Seattle, November 25th. Go get tickets for that. I'd love to see you up there. So fucking A right. Am I fucking right? Don't get, don't get offended by the fucks. Because I just read an article that psychologists, this is in Scientific American, this is in bullshit, psychologists have found that swearing may serve an important function in relieving pain. Oh yeah, shit yes. Now, look, I, I, the article's all about, uh, it's based on these college students. They did a, a test where, where the, they had these kids put their hands in ice cold water and they were able, uh, one group said a, a sort of, uh, a kind of repetitive non-curse word, a neutral word, and then they let the other kids say, uh, a, a curse word, like, fuck, shit, god damn, this is cold, holy fuck. And those, that, that bunch, uh, reported less pain and actually were able to keep their hand in the water for 40 seconds longer. Now, the broader effects is that they think it's an emotional thing, that, that cursing is linked to the brain circuitry, but they've decided that it's primitive, like the evolutionary part, the fight or flight part. So this is some deep primal fuck that when you say fuck or what the fuck or God damn it, you're tapping into that source that enables you to rise above pain for a second and move through whatever you need to move through. Now, it's not specific about what kind of pain. You don't have to be having your arm ripped off by an animal. Uh, You know, it could just be traffic. It could just be a a slow and chronic uh, depressive sort of ache from either a broken heart or a bad uh, childhood. You could be in one perpetual primal fuck your entire life. You know, just choose your moments. You know, you kind of operate at that kind of like, fuck. 
fuck, uh, fuck. That's kind of going, that's humming along at the core of your being. And every once in a while, you'll punctuate it with a little fuck. And then, like, bang, man, you get that relief. You get that transcendence from pain. How do you like that? Scientifically validated that getting a little more fuck in your life will help you get through those tough moments and enable your fight or flight response and ease a little pain. I recommend it, as I always do on this show. I recommend the fuck. Oh, that's out of the way. Let's do a little of this. Bow. Oh, yeah. Just shit my pants. Fuck. And I said shit, too. Like, I am feeling so good because of the amount of uh, fucking I'm doing. And I, in terms of saying it, and there's enough going on in the other area of my life as well. But but I, I just wanted to share that with you. JustCoffee.coop. Do that up. I hope there's not a lot of kids listening to this. I apologize for the profanity, but I, it's helping me cope. That's how I'll rationalize it. And I don't think you, you – maybe you should be teaching your kids how to cuss as opposed to telling them that they shouldn't. And maybe when they do it and, and they're reprimanded by strangers, you know, insinuating that you're a bad parent, have the kids say, look, I am dealing with pain in a very primal way. I am honoring an evolutionary instinct that goes back to the beginning of mankind by shouting an expletive to deal with this situation that you're causing me. You're causing me pain and anger. That's why it's happening. We got to change up. All right. Look. My cat Boomer uh, apparently doesn't like me anymore. I don't know how it happened. It, it just all of a sudden he's uh, nervous around me and he's decided that he doesn't like me anymore. And that's going on with uh, LaFonda as well because Jessica's uh, in the house and she's taken the love of my cats away from me. And I, I promised you, and I know you've been hanging with bated breath about my uh, my visit to the urologist tomorrow. That I don't think about death a lot. I think about it in a general way. I think about it like if I'm laying in bed at night, I think like, okay, I'm alive. What if I didn't wake up? Would I know that I'm not awake forever? That that kind of thing. And it tweaks me out a little bit. But as I said last Thursday, you know, I, when you start talking about organs, I get a little uh, tweaky. But uh, you know, I think it's rooted in the fact that I'm afraid. I mean, who isn't afraid? And when you go to a doctor, that's where it all gets real. So tomorrow I'm going to the urologist, and that's going to be the full-on, you know, you know, that experience. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. I just want to make sure everything's okay. I'm at that age now where I have to do that. And so now I'm paranoid and I'm nervous because I got to go to a doctor. So I'm seeing signs and symbols in everything. I'm seeing omens and, and gifts everywhere I turn. And what happened was I woke up the other day. My cats aren't loving me. Uh, monkey's still okay. He's on my team. Monkey's on team Mark. But I look outside and I see a stray I've never seen before. And it was, there was something wrong with this cat, man. There was something wrong with this cat. All right. Yeah. I've seen fucked up cats before, you know, and they all have their charm and you do sympathize with them or you get angry at them or whatever you're going to do with a cat, whatever you project onto a cat. But this strange, weird, its tail was a little fucked up. It was all black and I just saw it eaten out of the bowl. And I opened the door to get him away initially because I'd never seen it before. I wanted to see what I was dealing with. And the cat didn't respond. I sat there clapping my hands. The cat didn't respond. So now I've got a deaf black cat eating out of this bowl who doesn't even know I'm there making noises to scare him away. And then he looks up at me and his eyes are all cross-eyed and off and his face is a little twisted. It was like a David Lynchian cat. I had this moment where I sort of slipped into some weird waking dream state because of the creepiness of this deaf, cross-eyed black cat eating out of my cat's bowl. And I, for some reason in that moment, said, what does this mean? This can't be good. This creepy cat was sent from the underworld to deliver a message, and I can't figure out what it is. And I got to go to the doctor tomorrow. Damn it. Obviously, it has nothing to do with anything. But if something is up, up in me, I'm going to blame that cat. Hey, folks, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm going to because I got a thing to do, got a thing to talk about, got an email here. Okay? Subject line, maybe for stamps. Hey, Mark Marin, your new sponsor, Stamps.com, is freaking me out a little. My last name is Stamps, so hearing you plug the sponsor is like you're trying to get my attention constantly. Imagine someone saying, do you use Marin? Let me tell you about Marin. I'm sure you would love some Marin. Thanks, Michael. You can assume what his last name is. 
The reason I'm bringing that up is Stamps.com is our sponsor today, and I've been using Stamps.com. I'm not pulling your leg. It's incredibly easy. I still mail a lot of merchandise out of my house. And all you got to do, it takes you like five minutes. You just get it, go on to stamps.com and you can print U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. You really don't even have to go to the post office anymore. If you organize yourself properly and you time yourself right, you can just give your mail guy or gal a big bag of stuff that you've already stamped because you went to stamps.com. I know you're going to miss waiting online at the post office, but think about it this way. Stamps.com never closes. Huh? How do you like that? Also, you can do international stuff. They have customs forms. They they got like an entire post office right there, and you don't even have to go to the post office. Right now, there's a special offer. If you use my promo code WTF, you get a no-risk trial plus a $110 bonus offer, which includes a digital scale and $55 of free postage. This is for a limited time. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the radio microphone at the top of the home page and type in WTF. That's stamps.com. Enter WTF and make your own stamps. I mean, come on. Have a little fun. So, uh, Norm McDonald in the garage, nervous. (laughs) <laughs> How the hell could you be nervous? I mean, do you always get nervous? Uh, I get uh, somewhat nervous about uh, things sometimes, sure. Yeah? Like everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you've done so much, it doesn't go away? Uh, it hasn't with me. I, I mean, I don't get... Uh, um, God, now I'm stumbling. And uh, It's all right, man. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll open like this. I think I have a weird memory of you that you probably wouldn't remember. I think I was in... I think I was in your hotel room. The really? the when you were watching, I showed up at your hotel room when you had just done your first Letterman with Caroline Ray. Yeah, yeah, and I I think that I actually watched you not watch your first Letterman <laughs> on television. Is that possible? I'm thinking. No, I, I, well, I would know. I would not watch it. That's for sure. It was but... like 1989. Is that about right? Yeah, I think I'm not the dates, probably about that. Yeah, that's Cause, funny because I, yeah, I, I know Caroline and I remember you, uh, and I remember Caroline. All well, my memories are so vague. Right. Well, it was weird because I, I barely knew Caroline, and we were sort of hanging around, and you know, with this, this group of comics, and I had a car, and she goes, "Let's go to the hotel." My friend Norm, <laughs> it just did Letterman tonight, so we go over there, and I that was the first time I ever met you, and I don't know how how much you even played the states because it was right, i didn't right. know any comedians from the states that was my problem yeah right and so <laughs> i go up to this room i meet you and you're about to go on letterman and and i'm standing there with caroline and you were on your bed face down with your hands <laughs> hiding your eyes for the entire time does that sound like a real thing no that would be me uh, i can't uh, <laughs> well you know how it is when you know uh how bad you are and uh you know what i mean did you know you i know mean I, well I, I know that's how we perceive ourselves i don't right. know if it's really true you did well right well we have we can probably we probably know more than uh, the, another person no we don't about ourselves i don't know no but i mean how can like are you not able to watch yourself now uh, no that's pretty hard like you know because um um, I, I really like comedy. Like I yeah. love comedy. Like I guess all comedians do, or whatever. But uh, it, um, it's always uh, you always think you're uh, better than when you see yourself. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. In the moment, it feels like you've uh, yeah. you've won, right. and then you watch it, and you're like, oh, why am I doing that with my eyebrow? <laughs> no, it's, can, no. it's like when you hear your fucking voice. <laughs> I'm especially me, yeah. Because I don't think I sound weird, but then people come up to me and go, "Hey, I can do an impression of you." And I fucking, or, guys, fucking sounds like a retard. He's like, "Hey, I'm, 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 fuck, man, is that what I sound like?" So, um, it's funny when you have a weird voice, because yeah. uh, a lot of times I don't give a fuck why people laugh. I don't give, you know. But I've always been very like uh, material dependent mm-hmm. in my stand up. Mm-hmm. I got work like a motherfucker to get laughs. But uh, people go like, "Oh, you can just talk with your weird voice." I'm like, "No, I can't." You just maybe you think that shit. But I remember when I do like, because when I first came to LA and I do auditions, and then I would have the best material of the ten guys. Yeah, I would get the most laughs. Yeah, but I would never get hired. Yeah, and then I realized why it's because they want the fuckers that can uh, uh, get laughs without material. I can't do that. That's what you need for a sitcom. Right. If you're, if you're, you know, have a sitcom going and a guy has some good jokes, 
well, you can hire him as the writer. Yeah. You want the big fucking guy. The charismatic with, guy. Yeah, with no material that, at that, all. That seems to have an emotional range. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> when com- I did my first uh, uh, comedy festival thing, that Montreal thing. What year was that? Fuck, I don't know. Like 87? Like, uh, I don't know dates. Yeah. But it was around there. And uh, How long had you been doing comedy at that point? Six months. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, but it was Canada, so we got a home so that was like court in, thing. In, in in American years, that's four years. No, the, no, I'm <laughs> saying because the Montreal Comedy Festival was in Canada, right. we had a quota yeah. to fill. You know, oh, I, right. I would never have gotten on it if I was in the states. But uh, so I got my five minutes. Just that wrote. Though that's the way I used to do comedy. I'd memorize every fucking word, and so I had it all figured out and shit. Right, and so then I go there. I meet Sinbad. Right. <laughs> So I, I didn't know who Sinbad was. And he goes, uh, and we're, he's completely relaxed. I'm all he's wearing thinking about my Some shirt. sort of one-piece outfit. <laughs> he, yeah. did. he did. Uh, his hair matched his uh, shirt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, they were both orange. Yeah, yeah. So then he said, uh, he was just so relaxed, and he said, uh, hey, let's go. i got to get some socks. So we go to this fucking store, right? When we first go into the store, there's yeah. no one there. It's a yeah. small store. So there's no one there. The lady's in the back. Yeah. So the lady takes a minute to come out. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, where's that lady? You know, and nobody here, you know? And I'm like, yeah. And so she, he comes out, he gets his fucking socks. Nothing happens, right? So then that night at the gala, yeah. I do my carefully constructed material. Yeah. Sinbad comes out. He goes, what the fuck is going on? And he doesn't swear. He goes, yeah. what's going on with these stores with socks? I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> And then he's like, "You go in the store, and uh, they don't. There's no one there." And then people are agreeing with him. I'm like, "What?" <laughs> it didn't make any. None of it made any sense, except that he destroyed and I didn't. Uh, that's when I realized that uh, that I was missing a whole bunch of stuff. Because I guess at first you think you're good and stuff like that. No, you are good. But and I think that the fact is, really, if if you were to look at it in another way, that if people are able to do an impersonation of you, that means you have a defined style. Whereas, like, I guarantee you there's not a lot of people that can do Sinbad, though you did just do a pretty good one. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was trying to do it as unracist as possible. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think, like, uh, I don't know that much stuff. But I know I think that with stand-ups, a lot of people, um, uh, it's hard for a person that creates material yeah. is usually a kind of a sensitive, shy kind of person, at least in my experience, yeah. with, with people you? that I've known. With, yeah, with, with, no, in your I, experience with yourself? Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I was always cr- crazy shy yeah. and stuff like that. Um, so, um, and I also very self-conscious of well, yeah, looking like an idiot. Yeah. So I couldn't go on stage and run around and dance. <laughs> so when I see guys that can do it, like when I see John Cleese, yeah. like this brilliant mind, yeah. and then he can do Act crazy like an retarded. idiot. Yeah, that's amazing. And also, of course, prior, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. It's so weird because I'm the exact same way, and I have not. I don't think I've talked to anybody on this show that has that same thing, where I am envious of a lot of comics that people would dismiss, you know, only because it's sort of like, well, how do they not feel like they be afraid that they're going to look like a dick? Like, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. like as soon as I've ever done anything physical, if I even think right. about it for a second, I'm like, I'm an asshole, yeah. and and they don't laugh. <laughs> I know, yeah. Like just recently, I was on Fallon and somehow did an impulsive. I saw you. I mean, the Dane Cook. Cook was very funny. Never done that. Yeah, it, was it just funny. it came out of nowhere. <laughs> I didn't second guess it, and it fucking worked. But if I would have said like for the five minutes I was sitting there, like I'm going to do this Dane Cook thing, maybe I'm it's because the... you were embodying Dane Cook, right? In, in yeah, that, in, in, yeah, yeah, that I actually had the confidence of Dane. Yeah, Cook. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why, right? <laughs> yeah. I but yeah, I was always uh, uh, astonished. But and I'm also like you. I'm envious of uh, people that because I'm. You know, I used to be frozen on stage. Right. I still don't take the mic out of the stand. Um, when you did so, you did comedy six months, and you were at the Montreal. What is it? The Canadian scene is so different because I talked to Russell Peters recently, and there's this weird work ethic that if you're one of the guys up there, you're going to work, and you're going to work for one guy. Yes. but you're going to work. Yeah, it was a great place to start because, uh, first of all, there's no industry in Canada. Mm-hmm. There's no movies or television. Isn't there a little? And doesn't if you I stay, think there might be now, but when I was doing it, there was none. Because it seems or it's like horrible. If, if you stay there long enough and you don't leave, that you will be given a television show of some kind for, right, for a certain it, amount of time. It's off. They're awful. You know, Canadian uh, everything about can, <laughs> Canada sucks. <laughs> really? In ter- well, in terms of of art, entertainment, yeah. yeah. Like all the entertainers leave, and most of them don't want to go. Most of them are mad because. Because the, they weren't recognized in Canada, you know, yeah, yeah, they yeah. had to come to the states. But uh, um, 
But so we didn't, anyways, we didn't have uh, movies or TV to do. Yeah. And so we just did stand up and we thought that's all there was, was just going, which was fun, like just being stand ups and going around the country doing stand up. And then uh, when I got to LA, I suddenly I was like, "Holy fuck! Is everybody's handsome?" Like I didn't because we weren't handsome. We were just <laughs> well, comics old weren't ghosts. supposed to be handsome. <laughs> no. Louis C.K. once said that to me, like if furious at some point when I think when Jay Moore first started doing comedy, <laughs> like yeah. right when Jay Moore showed up on the scene. <laughs> It, and this is not meant to piss off Jay Moore in any way. You know, Louis was aggravated because he's like, it's, it wasn't for them. He's good looking. You know, no, I, I just want to do Letterman before I'm fat and bald. <laughs> no, it is very true. Handsome. I used to really have problems with handsome people uh, like uh, friends, you know, yeah. would bother me so much. I watched Friends and then I saw I said, fuck, these are the funniest, super handsome people ever. I, I'll give that to them. You know what I mean? Who are your guys? I, it's probably there? harder if you're so fucking handsome. Well, yeah, because people expect you to have your shit together. So I think that's yeah. the hardest sell for handsome people. It's like, my life is fucked up. It's like, yeah. look at you. How is that possible, you fuck? <laughs> <laughs> really? Is your life bad? You've got all your hair, asshole. <laughs> Hard to be a sympathetic character when you're really attractive. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. When you started out, though, who were your guys? Like, who were the guys you hung out with? Are they still around? Do you still keep in touch with them? Uh, in Canada, they're like uh, um, the guys that were big. You know, most people, Canada's like, it's the same with every fucking uh, goddamn city I go to. Everybody's like, this is the fucking best comedy oh, yeah. city and all yeah. that horse shit. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember I'd be on the road, you know, wherever the fuck you were, you know, you'd be in Dallas or something, go, Oh man, these are the funniest guys ever. Wait till you and there's always there was always I remember, the one mythic guy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go fucking Kenny, that yeah. guy, the funniest guy ever. But he's a heroin right, addict. Yeah, if he wakes up, he's <laughs> hilarious. And then he would shamble in on Saturday night, <laughs> say something about AIDS or something. You go, what the fuck? Is that? <laughs> he doesn't seem that funny. I guess he's funny if you know him. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> the local hero that could never get out. <laughs> exactly. And then like you know, when, whenever they're past that prime of whatever made them popular in that small scene, then they finally go, I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to L.A. and right, there are right. these broken men. It's like, no, he used to be the guy. That's but he wasn't <laughs> really the guy. I met Dan, uh, uh, Rodney Dangerfield because I had, uh, do you remember the book? I think it was The Last Laugh or something yeah. about Lenny. Yeah. There was a secondary guy. I wish I could remember his name. Joe something. There was a there was a character. Yeah, in yeah, that yeah. Book. Oh, wait, wait. S, uh, uh, fuck. Uh, Ansis. Joe Ansis. Joe Ansis. Yeah. So I'm. Re I know. I read that book. It was like the Bible. The Lenny. The Lenny Bruce biography by Albert Goldman. By Goldman. Lenny. Yeah. And so Ansis was the funny guy. Right. That never went on stage. That's right. The brilliant funny guy. Right. And they all. You know. I. But it's, and I met him. You did. With Dangerfield. You did. Dangerfield came and did Saturday Night Live, and uh, he, Joe Ansis was with him. I was like, Fuck, Joe Ansis. Yeah. Man. And then I waited about two hours for him to say anything funny. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, maybe he just fucking got drugs for them or something. Or maybe it just took longer back then. You, you know, maybe it wasn't so about laugh efficiency. <laughs> well, yeah. And maybe also he was stuck in that time. Maybe Lenny Bruce, like, if he were right here now, would not be very funny. But, but you know, I think that book, I think Goldman probably exploited that. Because, like, in my mind, behind every genius, there's some dude going, that fucker stole my shit. Yes, you, you know, definitely. and and usually there's a reason. Well, well, then why didn't you get on stage? It's like I don't do that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Shut up. And also, the authors don't know shit. Yeah, like you know, every time they do a fucking article, they, they come to you. I'm sure they've done articles on yeah. you, and then you you try to tell them yeah. like what's the real story. Yeah, and they still fucking write what they want, like what they had already seen it. And they take it out of context. They frame yeah. it the way they want it. They've, Have you had a lot of experience with that? A little bit, like uh, people. I, uh, there was a time when I was on Saturday Night Live. Everyone hated it, you know. Well, when you were doing update, yeah, they hated Far. They hated uh, Sandler and Farley. You mean critics? Uh, critics, yeah. So uh, it was pretty. Everybody was, oh, it's dead. Saturday Night Live dead and all that shit. And so uh, they came, and the guy had an agenda, obviously. And um, but he was very unfair. Like Sandler was very, very funny, and nobody's funny. It was funnier than Farley. And uh, then he presented it as if these guys were always doing shtick and everyone was looking away embarrassed and yeah. everything like that. And I remember him laughing. Yeah. So he, he, yeah. it was very frustrating. Did you fucking... And they made Farley. i never forget. It was on cover of New York Time, New yeah. York Magazine. And they had Farley do a photo shoot where he had a television on his head. Yeah. And it was it was kind of funny, but yeah. Farley's doing a big like a uh, yeah. crazy physical thing with this big TV on yeah. his head, and then they put it on the cover, and they said it's comedy comedy dead. Uh, and how did he respond to that? <laughs> he he wanted to go beat up the guy, and Lauren told Lauren said, "Oh really? <laughs> you can't you can't beat up people? <laughs> you can't beat up the 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 uh, the reporter? Yeah, yeah. But he was really that angry. 
He, yeah, he was so he was more angry because they they not for him, but because they attacked Sandler. Actually, he was very protective. Well, of that that Adam. whole crew you were you were part of that crew that they, they seemed tighter than most SNL crews, like Farley, Sandler, Spade. Yeah. You like you, you guys seem like a real kind of you know Rat Pack of uh, comedic. Uh, well, we were uh, pretty tight because we were, except for Farley, we were all stand-ups. Mm-hmm. So we kind of were, we didn't know how to, how to fuck to act or anything. And like, before us. Was Chris was, there too or no? Chris, uh, yeah, Farley? Rock or Rock? Oh, Rock was there too, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> You're all sitting around going, well, I don't know how to do a character. Yeah, we didn't know anything. So all we knew is how to directly talk into the camera. You know right. I mean, that's the only good thing we were good at. And, uh, but, uh, the rest of it was, was was real tough and so i wouldn't you know i would plead with people not to put me in sketches you know because <laughs> sometimes i would think of a good idea and write the sketch and knew yeah. i could do it but but uh i was so but but anyways the, yeah the point is like before us there was this great cast and even now there's this great cast of actors right which probably should be what saturday night Live is not yeah. stand up <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact i think all acting should probably preclude stand-ups for the most part <laughs> But now you know this, so they they know how to talk to each other, shit like that. <laughs> Me and Spade and Sam, fuck, what we didn't. Know I just can't remember. Ima- I can't imagine the the cynicism approaching a sketch. <laughs> that- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> With you guys. No, that's what we'd mostly do is we'd spend the first uh, half of the night writing the sketch and the second half of the night crumpling it up, <laughs> saying how shit it was. <laughs> because this is another thing that I noticed coming from stand up yeah. into. Because I was um, never had any desire to be anything other than a stand-up. Everything else would just accidentally happen from the stand-up, you know. But some, for some reason in Hollywood, they go, oh, I guess because of Bill Cosby or Roseanne Barr or some people who've had success right. in stand-up, they go, well, he can, he can do anything. Let's build a show around him. Yeah, he can just, do anything. Which is not an experiment. Give him some children. <laughs> Throw him in a living room. <laughs> not an experiment that's worked. <laughs> well, was that part of Lauren's thing? Wasn't that the season where he's like, let's, you know, let's use stand-ups? You know, it's sort of like that scene in The Right Stuff where it's like, you know, I want test pilots. Uh-huh. You know, I want stand-up comedians. Uh-huh. And and uh, did what was the struggle? Like, how often did you deal with Lauren around that stuff? Well, the great thing about Lauren is he'd do, he do you could do anything you wanted. He would tell you uh, w- w- wise things, you know, like wisdom or whatever. He's like a little Buddha guy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, so, it ever, did it ever make sense? Or did not you know, to me. He'd always walk away going, what the fuck? <laughs> to what? other people it did. <laughs> like, I remember one time he wanted me, like, this was actually uh, with, with Weekend Update. They wanted me to do Weekend Update um, with a lady. Yeah. Like, uh, two of us. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that sounds like shit. I don't want to fucking, that sounds like shit. <laughs> like, I'm like, if there's a lady and a dude, like, what are we making fun of local news? What the fuck yeah. is that? He's like, no, no. He's like, well, you'll be, he had some crazy, he goes like, I think he liked me because I didn't understand what he was talking about. All <laughs> and he goes like, uh, he goes, you'll be a Fred Astaire and she'll be ginger. You'll like, you know, give her the sex, like a comedy, and she'll give you the sex. And I was like, the dancers? What? And I didn't know what he was fucking talking about. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, I go, I don't want to fucking do it with a lady. Let Franken do it. You know? Yeah. So, uh, Franken was going to do it? Yeah, it was, it was Frank and me or somebody else. So uh, I didn't care that much about it So because uh, I could just do stand-up. But anyways, what happened was it was funny. Like Steve Martin walked in because he yeah. was hosting. Yeah. And Lauren, to embarrass me, went, let's see what Steve thinks about it. And Steve Martin doesn't give a fuck about anything. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, he goes, Norm wants to do with the lady, but he thinks. And he does right. this big, long spiel, and Steve Martin's completely <laughs> uninterested. Really been dragged into something yeah. he wanted no part of. But luckily, mm-hmm. he fucking just said, out of the blue, he goes, he goes, oh, fuck. He goes, I did this award show with some broad, and uh, they paired me up with her, and she fucked everything up. <laughs> Like, I guess they stuck him with yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so then Lauren goes, oh, well, there's some uh, support from an unexpected place. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you got the solo update? Yeah, Steve was, Martin, because yeah, he was he such a, a hero to Lauren. He had a bad experience with a, <laughs> with an award show, and you get to run the solo on the update? Yeah, it was awesome. That's a fucking good moment. But I would have been in big trouble with a lady. But then later, he did it, they did it with a lady and a dude. Because he kept uh, saying, oh, remember, because I know Saturday Night Live, you know, like all of us, right? Yeah. And he was like, remember, uh, remember Jane yeah, and yeah. Jane and uh, Dan. Dan? And I was like, that was shit. Like, I remember Jane, you ignorant slut. Right. But I also remember all the rest of the fucking shit. Like, he had a hat on and pretended to be from the, like, they played characters. Yeah. And I, I was not interested in that because Dennis kind of changed it to Dennis Miller where, 
Where you do jokes. Where you do jokes. And you don't, you're not doing a parody of a fucking Did, Now, what, what was the reaction to you when you first took up, Update? Because I remember, and it was you definitely made it your own because you're one of those guys, as you're sort of uh, establishing here, that you can only do what you do. Yeah, I can't do... Well, I can't... Uh, yeah, the big problem, I guess, with me with Update is I'm not politically aware of at all. So I was like, well, I can't uh, be political. Right. You know, I can't... I don't know how to do it. But it was interesting, though, because your update and the way you do comedy, there it rides that line of, like, uh, you're you're almost, like, the, the thing that makes it so cutting and shocking is it's so fucking plainly said that oh. this is what bullshit oh, that's is. Nice. <laughs> no, but it's a good thing. That yeah, you're, well, it was my plan. <laughs> I mean, no... Just I, to cut through the bullshit. Yeah, I thought... Because I don't like cleverness that much. Like, I always was... Um, against, What's I, an example of that? Like, sexual innuendo uh, oh, rather right. than sexual... Like, you know what I mean? I don't like that my mother can giggle at some joke on Will and Grace... And then I can say to her, no, no, you know what that means, right? He's talking about fucking, her, fucking the other guy in the ass. And then she's like, oh, no. I'm like, it's the same fucking thing. Why can't you just fucking... <laughs> Why can't they just say he's going to fuck him in the ass? Yeah. And you get the same Isn't laugh. Isn't it something cowardly about, like, cloaking it or something? Like, I, I'm right, not, right. I don't know psychological shit, but it must be some level of uh, dissociating yourself slightly from what you actually mean. From the truth. Like, the the, truth. That, like innuendo protects you from seeing the reality and yes. enables you to laugh at it. Yeah, yeah. But why need... Like, good God, in these days, why would you need innuendo? Like, yeah, no. I to me, it. I'm shocked that anyone thinks you could be shocked by anything. Uh, yeah, I, I find that now the only thing that's shocking is when someone tells the fucking truth. And then yeah, people are yeah, like, yeah. what just happened? <laughs> right, right. That guy can't come back. <laughs> like, an update, I was always saying, I, th I always thought, I said, the perfect joke would be if the punchline and the um, and the setup were almost identical. Yeah. And then we, I was saying, can we ever get a joke like that? That would be the coolest. And then we actually did get one joke that was pretty close to that, not perfect, but it was uh, Lyle Lovett is um, Lyle Lovett and uh, and uh, Julie Roberts are getting a divorce, and uh, uh, you know people close to the couple say the reason is because. Uh, he's Lyle Lovett and she's Julie Roberts. <laughs> so it was pretty close. You know, the setup and the punchline were pretty close to each other. I was happy with that, that one. That was the grail? <laughs> yeah, that was the grail. <laughs> I don't know if we completely got it. But. That, when that, that YouTube thing that was going around, I think it was, were you at a, where was that where you did the, the old jokes at the roast? Oh, yeah, that was a roast, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, what, was the, what was your agenda behind that? Um, I mean, what were you thinking? Because it like, got very popular, and, and everyone thought it was so fucking, you know, it was like, know. They put it a was little, like genius. They put, it wasn't but, genius. <laughs> what, no, 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 it wasn't that it wasn't genius, but I just want to know no, why wasn't. you did it. Well, the re re real reason, it was because it was a, so, a roast for Bob Saget, right. who's a friend of mine. Yeah. And I, and I don't, I, 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 I guess I don't like roasts. Yeah. Uh, but, um, um I mean, I, I I shouldn't say that. I guess I admire. I got, I don't really admire. People. It's a certain style. <laughs> it's a certain style. <laughs> I've come to accept things. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> but Saget said, "Can you come and roast me?" And Saget's like a really nice guy. And yeah. I said, "Fuck, no, I don't know, man." He goes, "Come on, can we, I don't know why he kept pushing it." So, yeah. So I'm like, it was the night before, and and so this guy Sandy Gallon, who was the produces these roasts and stuff. Yeah. Or Joel Gallon? Yeah. I don't know. I, forget, I don't know his name. I only did one, and that was all I could take. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. And so he said, I said, I don't know how to do this stuff. He goes, just be shocking. And so he, uh, luckily when he said shocking, I thought, oh, well, if I do the opposite, you know, it's uh, like as I've heard people go, I got it. I go, well, what the fuck is to get? Yeah. Like it's a, a grade three arithmetic. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, a simple, it's not a... <laughs> so so your, cho your choice was just to be like, I'm going to do these old, beautiful jokes. Yeah. Just and they to were counteract also, all, all the bullshit right. of the roast. There was jokes that my dad had... When I was a kid, my dad, uh, when I was starting comedy, he yeah. gave me a book. It was very touching. He gave me a book of, that he had of uh, jokes you say to people at their retirement parties. Oh, really? To help me with yeah, my yeah. stand-up. Yeah, so yeah. it was very touching. It was close to... Like one of those 101 jokes yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's where I got the jokes. And a, a lot of them were like so anti <laughs> Antiquated, <laughs> like they were. Like there was one where I said to Gilbert Gottfried, "Like you, you remind me of a typewriter because your head is under wood or your neck is under wood." Or something. It was just so silly. And they were all hilarious. Everyone was laughing their ass off. No, they weren't. <laughs> When, like when you're standing up there, yeah. First of all, you can't. You know how when you're on stage, you can't see the whole audience. You can just see those. Well, where did you do it? Because when I did it, there must have been two thousand fucking people. A lot in of this, people in this Hilton ballroom. It was horrendous. Yeah, it takes forever. Yeah, but because of the, you know, I could all I could see was the angry eyes of Alan Thick at the <laughs> first table. <laughs> 
<laughs> just like being angry. It was kind of shocking to me because I was like, it, it, what, you know what was weird about that? Is no. that people fucking thought I was, literally thought I was crazy. I yeah. Was, like I was like, I understand, uh, if you didn't like it, I might not even like it. I don't know if I would even like that yeah. kind of shit. You know, I could go, that's self-indulgent bullshit. But to to actually fucking think I'm like uh, serious, you know? Yeah, I mean, God yeah, damn. like that. Well, they people love to do that. I mean, did you watch the Charlie Sheen one? Yes, yes. And it, I what, tell you what, I oh, sorry. Well, what do you like? I mean, what, because like a lot of people are saying that that was just it, it's there's no line whatsoever, and that you know it is something other than just being funny, and that it's gotten you know kind of just brutal and and painful to watch. Right. Well, yeah, like, cause, uh, you know, when we get interviewed as comics, like, oh, people always go, like, is there any line? And we go, no, but there's lines. Of course, there's fucking lines. You know? Yeah. Uh, you're a human being. Well, hopefully. you yeah, and, and, But I remember they were talking about William Shatner, Rose, already told me this, that <laughs> William Shatner's fucking wife had just drowned in a pool yeah. three months earlier, and, and they had to get all the comics together and go, look, no jokes about his wife drowning. And they were yeah. all like, ah, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Yeah, and no, I was yeah. like, <laughs> would it even occur to you to fucking do that joke? The guy's still wearing a black ribbon and his clothing <laughs> is torn. I, I love Patrice on that, though. I, I, cause I love Patrice. Yeah, he's great. And he did it. I never saw a guy that did the roast so good. He he, because he didn't do all that. Um... Well, I mean that line is interesting because it's really a personal line. I mean, when you're a comic, you know when you've crossed the line. I mean, I mean that's really the line is like, what can you what can you get away with? Well, I guess the line's up to you as to, right. as to whether you want to. I when I was on uh, SNL, you start to read uh, an update. You start to read uh, newspaper articles and forget that they're people. You know, right. And I had a, a hellish thing with this uh, private citizen. I never did a joke again about a private citizen after that. But uh, someone had uh, uh, been hit on the Brooklyn Bridge, and uh, the story was funny because their liver was over here, and then their spinal column was over here. It was yeah. all sp <laughs> yeah. spread across the bridge. Right, right. What and was the, the joke? The, the joke was uh, uh, he's recuperating in, uh, in the hospital. And he's fine, you know, but it was so absurd yeah, because yeah. he'd been spread by. Anyways, then I get a phone call and I go, oh, fuck, that was a real person's friend or father. Friend. Yeah, yeah, just phoned me and I'm like, I don't know. You know, they <laughs> Their fucking husband got torn apart on the Brooklyn Bridge and then they, uh, they turn on, on the TV. I'm like, hey! Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's go in! They turn on the TV to, hey. get, to get their mind off of things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, so you know, you 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 understand after a while, <clears throat> and even with politicians, like they're still human beings. And, yeah, barely, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're the worst kind of fucking people in the world. <laughs> that's true. all of them. Uh, the well, well, that's, well I agree. I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, everybody thinks you're all leftist. And everything. Well, I mean, you know, I I definitely land on the lefty side of things on you know ideological terms, but I, I found that from doing political talk radio. Just, you know, being, you know, carrying water for any of them, you just got to realize the quality of people you're dealing with. You're yeah. dealing with fucking corporate whores who are operated by business interests. So, you know, really it's going to come down to, you know, however you view politics, the question is, do you give a shit about poor people? And, right. uh, and, and are we being taken advantage of? Right. Now, if people want to frame that as, you know, Obama's a communist and draining us of our livelihood, well, that's your particular delusion, and, and that's fine. I mean, right. but but it, it, I just got disillusioned with all of it because they're, these are not quality people. I mean, I did a joke about uh, Michelle Bachman on, on Real Time. I saw that. Yeah, and I was getting flack from this, you know, you know a very small portion of the right yeah. you know that they were like he's got he's a misogynist i'm like she's a fucking pig <laughs> she's a fucking politician how do you can you name me two politicians that command any respect whatsoever how, why do we respect yeah. these people these people are car salesmen they're idiots they're 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 more disingenuous than anybody as performers and they basically figured out a way to bait and placate morons into you know voting against their their self-interest that's an amazing skill but is it respectable i don't know do you respect a guy that sells you you know horse shit in the guise of a health supplement i agree with you <laughs> I, I mean i think politicians are more are are, are terrible i i have much, i mean people uh, attack evangelists and but at least evangelists offer something Right. Well, they 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 after the immediate relief of someone's uh, you know pain and, yeah. and aggravation with a, another line of bullshit. But but nonetheless, I mean, it, yeah. it, it, they're pretty evil too. Well, I, I mean, I know. you know, with politics, it's like, yeah, I, I I don't like to get into it that much anymore. Yeah, let's not get into this shit, man. Okay, buddy. Because it's getting. <laughs> <laughs> I can see people not laughing now. 
No, I mean, but you know, <laughs> laughter. But you know, I I know that you've gotten into a little bit of flack around it. But you, you're you're flack around what? around politics. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Well, just that you know, you've said things that people have reacted to, but you're you're not like a political comic. I'm you know? not political. I, I I've said I've only said things that, on purpose to provoke people. Right. Once in a while. Once like, in a while. You like doing that though. Once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I've never. Uh, uh, but I'm. Uh, but I. But I've never. Um, because I don't know enough. And well, yeah, because yeah. I, and because I don't respect uh, political uh, humor when it's nothing but gossip. Yeah, and mostly comics and people like us, you know, people who are obviously First Amendment warriors to a certain uh, degree. We like living the way we want to live. Uh, so it's really just going to come down to to money. It's yes. like you know, how do I keep my money? I mean, that's the biggest political question that most righties ask yeah. themselves. It's like yeah. I'd like to keep as much as my money as possible. And if that's a if that's in a minority opinion, how do we get this majority of poor people to get me to keep my money and believe that they're doing the right thing? Yeah, it's a tough <laughs> fucking thing because uh, if every apparently I read this, if all the money in the world was equally divided among everybody, everybody would be dead fucking poor <laughs> yeah you know there's like there's these moments where like i i don't talk about it as much as i used to but then there's like there's moments where you're like there's a moment that i could i was on a fucking radio show the other day and this was an interesting thing because it's it's about professionalism uh -huh. you know i don't you know i don't do political talk radio yeah. you know i've got my political views and uh and and they're fairly general you uh -huh. know i'm not trying to support you know any politician but you know i i have the the way i think about things right, and, but sure. there are politicians that represent the opposite of the what I think. So I'm on this talk show with a guy. It's a Fox affiliate, but, you know, I'm there to plug my comedy mm -hmm. and talk about my podcast and be funny with this dude who's a talk show host. He's a radio professional. He runs a, an entertainment show for the yeah. most part. Yeah. But he's been dying to talk to Rand Paul about the bridge situation because I'm in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky. He's I the see. fucking senator. Right. They got bridges falling down, and he's been trying to get this guy on the show. And the guy just... he calls in when i'm there you know so like now i've got like if i was doing political talk radio i mean it would have been like you know what the fuck are you thinking you know you and your libertarian bullshit and you know, how are we gonna pay for this like i would have jumped in and done that but there was this moment where it's like i just done a segment with this radio professional he was like god it's great to talk to a guy who knows how to be on radio we're having a good uh -huh. time hold on the senator's on the phone and i gotta sit there and go oh do i do this <laughs> do, you know, would it be worth it to sabotage this for some lefty uh uh you know credit you know credibility <laughs> Yeah, and, and then I, I realized, like, dude, you know, he's a radio guy, you're a comedian, you're having a good conversation, he's trying to talk to this guy about a local problem, just shut the fuck up and, and, and let him do his job, uh -huh. and then when you come back, you, you know, get back to what you were talking about. Uh -huh. And I chose to do that, but I, yeah. I, but I did walk out saying, like, you pussy, Why <laughs> you? you had such an opportunity there. You know, I was on Politically Incorrect a couple of times, yeah. and... Uh, Fuck, man! You, you know you have to have an opinion about every goddamn thing on that show. So, uh, or you can just do a little homework and write some jokes. Yeah, that, yeah. but there's sometimes I remember at the break, like Scott Carter, go enough with the jokes. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'll never forget it. Like we fucking, I'm very unlearned, and so before the show, uh, Scott came in. Uh, it was the the, the producer. Yeah, he's been producer. on the show. Yeah. So he said, "What do you think about China and Taiwan?" <laughs> And seriously, I I'd only I only know those as words, you know. So I was like, I don't know anything. Like, can I have another subject? So, anyways, then we get out because yeah. he goes because because Bill believes this. I mean, anyways, when we get out, the fucking we're introducing the guy beside me, the smart guy, right? Mm -hmm. He wrote a book on China and Taiwan. Right. right. So fucking Bill Maher, he starts with me. He yeah. goes like, what was it, China and Taiwan? I I go, I don't know. I'm fucking ask this guy. What do I do? I, I'm a nightclub comic. What? Like that's what made me uh, laugh with that show. Everyone's opinions equal, right? You know, right? Like a, a, a nightclub comic and an expert, or uh, and then another thing I find I always found funny about that show is the comedians try to be very serious, and then the serious guys are trying to get jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, not it's not always our our shining. But I do, moment. I do, I do like Bill. Though. No, Bill's great at what he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, he's he's a he started out a straight up joke dude, and he knows his shit. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and it's. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You know what's funny about him? I don't know if I should say this or not, but it, I mean, he, he's probably aware of it. When he does his monologue, have you noticed when he does his monologue, he does a Johnny Carson? No, yeah, oh no, definitely. He well, definitely he, he models must be aware himself. Of it. I, I think, and I think he's, that's been his style for a long time. He yeah, definitely okay. takes the posture. But I find you know. it very funny because you know he's got the posture and the timing and everything, and he's yeah. like, 
And then she came in his face. Yeah. You know, but it's <laughs> crazy <laughs> words come out. Hey, Carson would have loved to have done that. Yeah, he probably would have. <laughs> so when you grew up, I mean, what, what was the, what, what, what was the story in, in terms of, you say your dad gave you a joke book, but were you guys, you got along with your folks and everything? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, when I was very young, I was very, very, very shy and very afraid of everything. I mean, people say they're shy when they're kids, but I was like, uh, it was a pathology. Aren't you still afraid of everything? I am. I mean, I try, I try to hide it and deal with it, but on a day to day basis, I, I I'm get a, I, No, I'm not afraid of everything. I'm afraid of very few things. Like what? Uh, illness, yeah. death. Yeah. The, how'd you get it? How'd you get peace of mind out of the other shit? Well, when I was, I, um, when I was very, I, this is a weird thing that happened to me when I was young. Yeah. I don't know if this means anything. Let's I, try it. I remember it, but it was a moment I had that was uh, it wasn't religious or epinaphic or anything, but it, it transformed me to some degree. Is that I was always fucking so afraid of everything, and if I went to a store, I'd have to walk around forever before I could even face a, a person in the store to buy a pack of gum. I don't know why the fuck I was like this. Yeah. But anyways, when I was nine. Um, there was a blind, we lived in rural Ontario and there was a blind um, friend of my dad's yeah. um, that I had to, he said, take him to the store. And I was like, what the fuck? Like I have to take this blind fucker <laughs> and I'm already shy and shit. So I'm taking him to the store and then the fucker wants me to explain everything, <laughs> describe everything to him. Yeah. So I'm like, there's a, some grass over here and now there's a lamppost and this guy's all happy. Oh, what about the lamppost? I mean, it's just a lamppost. Yeah. So it goes on and on. But something happened to me during, it sounds bizarre, but something happened to me where I was actually, instead of always looking inward, which I think I'd always done before that one time, I was looking outward. Anyways, uh, while I was talking to him, I suddenly uh, had a sort of a hysteria, like I was laughing. I started laughing and yeah. stuff. And um, I don't even know why I'm remembering this, but I started laughing about everything. And everything seemed like um, very, very funny to me. <laughs> and then uh, a couple of weeks later, I saw a homeless guy and he was talking about, he was, he was talking, he started talking to me. Yeah. And he was talking to me about John D. Rockefeller. He's like, I was at John D. Rockefeller's funeral. Yeah. And all this shit. Yeah. And I was laughing at him and shit. And then he started laughing. <laughs> and I was like, it's all fucking crazy shit. <laughs> like, if something came to me. Yeah. Where I, I started and, uh, so now I find everything funny except like fucking real serious. Like I'm no fear of going on stage or anything about death and shit. Right. And so, uh, but the other thing I, but the problem with laughing is I, I will get, uh, it will build to a hysteria sometimes that I have to, uh, uh, crank a couple of benzos to uh, oh, yeah? prevent a panic attack. Cause, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, I can get you panic You can laugh attacks. yourself into an anxiety attack? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I start laughing and then it gets out of control, like hy hy hysterical. It's um, And I still have extreme sensitivity to um, to things. Like uh, I can... Uh, not not to nor not to life things, yeah. but to to like um, literature or art yeah. or something like that. I have incredible sensitivity. I kind of have to stay away from it. Like, what's an example? Like a painting or a yeah, fucking paintings. Like, I don't know anything about art, nothing at all, really. But I have had fucking experiences that have uh, been so hard on me. Like one time I was in New York and I, somebody dragged me to a fucking art museum, which I hate art. Yeah. And I was looking at this picture, this girl, and uh, I was like falling in love with her. She was so fucking beautiful, this fucking girl in this fucking picture. Yeah. And then uh, a guide was telling me the fucking thing was written, you know, drawn in the 16th century. Obviously, this lady was dead, long dead. <laughs> yeah. And here I am fucking in love with her. Yeah. And so I'm like, ah, fuck it. I, I was like so hard on me for so many days. <laughs> so I try not to... It sounds crazy, right? Not but, really. But, but I can be very... Uh, it sounds like that's a very good painting. It was an yeah. incredible painting. <laughs> but like, I, you know, I, I, uh, it you would make me cry. I didn't cry at my dad's funeral, though. Like, real life stuff seems so prosaic to me that it never really touches me much. So you have a, a sensitivity towards... Well, I mean, that's what art's supposed to do on some level. I guess for people that, like me that can't access uh, feelings or something it gets me well yeah i mean i get that with uh yeah i can get that with television commercials sometimes if i'm not protecting myself oh you mean like where they really can manipulate well, yeah you. well you jerk me around but like i remember there was this i kid. can be manipulated without and know i'm being manipulated yeah. yeah like some movies i'll just let it go yeah i know but like you know if my girlfriend's afraid afraid of something or needs some help i'm like i don't know what to 
Yeah. 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 This is crazy. I mean, maybe you should call a friend. I can't. I'm, maybe I'm, it's because we're we live in fantasy lives. Or something. I guess. I remember a kid when I was in uh, grade school. We read Old Yeller. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the dog gets then the, they got to put damn. the dog down, right? That's a motherfucker. Yeah, man. and this kid Jeff was just like you know sobbing uncontrollably as he read out loud, <laughs> and they had to take him to the nurse because he couldn't <laughs> pull it together. Oh my god! I, so that's Sten- so, they call it Stendhal syndrome. Is it? Is, oh, so there's a name for it? Well, there, there was apparently there was this guy uh, I guess named Stendhal or something, some 16th century guy, but he had an art museum that was so beautiful. I don't know if it's a- anecdotal, but uh, there was an art museum where people would come in and. And have nervous uh, breakdowns from the uh, beauty of the art. But that can go either way with you. It can be laughter or sadness. Yes, it's mostly laughter. The sadness doesn't throw me into anxiety. Uh, the laughter. What's the is, feeling though? Like, you're, like at a joke, or you're with friends or something, and you just can't you can't get it out of your head how funny it is, and then you yeah. you get anxious because you can't stop laughing. Like, yeah, I guess it's that. <laughs> like I laugh a lot. Like uh, that's fucking great which, as a comic. Yeah, I've, I've never, I tell you, I've never trusted people that don't laugh. Like, I've worked on shows and, you know, shit sitcoms and stuff like that where the motherfucker doesn't laugh. Yeah. He's the head writer. Yeah. I'm like, you're not laughing at yeah. nothing? Yeah. And I don't it's know. It's all math to him. Yeah, it's math. It's yeah. like haiku or some yeah. shit. And like the, but the best guys I've met are the guys that are able to laugh and fucking, you know. So what, with the, uh, so when you grew up, what'd your folks do? Uh, well, my dad, we were, we were like real poor and stuff. Uh, but later my dad became like a teacher. So we had a little bit of money. But yeah. We, we lived like on a rural. Like, With animals? Farm. It was a dead farm. Yeah. It was my father's father's farm. And but that by this point it had become dead. But it was interesting because everyone was old where I lived except me and my brothers. So I, I was with old men all the time. Yeah. But I like them a lot. Yeah. I really like them. Do you still like old people? Love them. I love super old people because uh, it's uh, like it, it it helps you with perspective, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like there's a fucking thing. There's a thing. Like I love country songs and shit, but there's a, this myth about the old guy that never forgot about the girl and he's drinking and yeah. shit. That's not true. Like <laughs> when you meet old people, you know what I mean? You go, hey, you're heartbroken. They go, oh, what? You know, they don't care. <laughs> I don't even remember her. Yeah, it's all like comedy yeah. to them. They go, yeah, there was yeah. I shit there. this morning. Everything's good. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> they have incredible perspective, and then I was so I was thinking if I, you can only get that perspective instantly, just pretend you're a fucking old man and and uh, and uh, forget it instantly. Well, it's so funny that so many young people dismiss old people as as burdens, or like you know, no one dies in the house anymore. Everybody's uh-huh. put out to pasture somewhere. Yeah, and uh, like I have to fight sometimes when I see really old people. I I my immediately I get this visceral kind of like, oh God, are they okay? Oh, like, oh that they might die. That they might die, or that like you know, like I'm gonna be that. Like if I'm lucky, uh, right. I get to be the guy that might make it across the street. Uh-huh. You, you know that that's a big payoff, and like it, it fucking throws my mortality in my in my head. In I my understand faith. that. Yeah, but I like, don't like. What, I, I mean, I'm not saying I like infirm people or being at deathbeds. No, anything. right? No, no. I know what you mean, but like if you like when you talk to old people that uh, they've lived through things, they have a perspective and a wisdom from actually living life. Yeah. And uh, like you don't learn a lot from a, you know, an old agoraphobic. Where it's like, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rodney Dangerfield said a great thing uh, to me that I, I mean, he was uh, he came to do a Saturday Night Live. Remind me to show you this picture I have of him. Of Rodney? Yeah. And I never met Rodney. Yeah. So he came to do a Saturday Night Live. Well, there's two things that are very funny. One is uh, when we were booking Rodney, like Lauren said, oh, Rodney's going to be in town. Put him on update. He'd always do that. Yeah. We'd, we'd have to somehow force this person on update, and we wouldn't know what to do but with But you him. had respect for him? Oh, I loved Rodney. Yeah. I loved Rodney. So uh, so uh, Jim Downey, who was a great writer and a Harvard, a true intellectual and stuff. Yeah. And he, um, so he's like, how are we going to do Rodney? And then so he had an idea where I would go, Rodney, you know, uh, you've been in the business now uh, 50 years, and... Uh, How's it going? He goes, I got no respect, no respect at yeah. all. You know? They do a couple of jokes. I go, I can't believe that. What about your, yeah. certainly your children have respect yeah. for yeah. you. He goes, I don't respect. Well, what about your bartender? You yeah. know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, he'd say, oh, my bartender, yeah, 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 guy, yeah. He's a guy. I said, double. He brought out a guy who looked like me. I, go, yeah. I can't believe this. Your own bartender? Yeah. So that was my, <laughs> we pitch it to Rodney. Uh, Daddy pitches to Rodney over the phone. And yeah. Rodney goes, he goes, what the fuck are you talking about? He goes, let me talk to Norm, you know? <laughs> so then he gets out with me. He goes, who is this fucking guy? He goes, doesn't he know my whole thing is no respect? <laughs> this fucking cocksucker thinks I, you know? So I was, so then I told Danny, he said, yeah, like Rodney just thinks of a writer as a guy you paid five bucks to in the back. Right. 
But anyways, Rodney came to the show, and uh, we had you know we have dress rehearsal, and, yeah. then, and then the show. So he's like, "Why do we have to fucking do dress rehearsal?" He goes, "I, I can't do Rodney. Yeah. Uh, why can't? Why do we have to do dress rehearsal? You know, I know my fucking jokes. I just go. I go. I, I don't know, Rodney. Like, I, I don't. <laughs> you just have to do it. And he goes, "Ah, fuck it, shit. You know. He goes, he goes. I tell you, kid. He goes, it's all waiting. You know. He goes, fuck it. He goes, you know. He goes, movies are shit. You know. All you do is fucking sit in a trailer and wait. He goes, fucking TV is shit." <laughs> He goes, it's all shit, you know. He goes, he goes, always remember this. And he like looks me in the eye, right? He goes, stand up, man. Stand up's the only thing. Yeah. Then there's like a two minute pause. He goes, stand up's fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just alone in a room with him. <laughs> so I shake his hand. He negated the entire world. Oh, the funniest uh, thing was uh, Josh. D- Josh was with us. Yeah. Was a uh, was an intern at Saturday Night Live. So. Uh, I guess I have a bit of a cruelty sometimes in me. But Josh would tell, always tell this joke to me, and I got him to tell this joke to everybody because I thought it was funny. Yeah. And he'd say, uh, Josh, this is how he talks. He's right here. But, yeah. Uh, he would go, uh, there's two gay guys, and uh, and one of, one of the gay guys goes to the other gay guy, I have a new game for you, hide and seek. Um, I'll hide. You try to find me. And, and, and if you find me, you get to fuck my ass. I'll be behind the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so I was this retarded joke and shit. So I'd make him tell everyone. Yeah. So that I made it. Do you remember I made you tell Rodney? Yeah. So I thought it was the greatest moment. Fucking Rodney were stuck, were stuck in this real narrow hallway. Yeah. The best <laughs> Rodney, you know, is standing there all curmudgeon. And he's like twitching. Yeah. Like, and moving <laughs> around. Exactly. Kind of rocking. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you got to hear this joke. And so then uh, Josh stumbles through the joke, and at the end, Rodney looks at him and goes, I tell you, kid, I'm not much for jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Again, most, for most of our jokes in the history of ever. Well, yeah, I remember the weird thing about Rodney, like, I you know, I never really met him, but I was... Oh, you didn't? Uh, no. How did you not meet him? Well, I mean, I, like, because I wasn't an established comic, you know, really, and, uh, like, I worked the door at the store, and he came on once. Yeah. Uh, and I used to see him around a bit, but like what broke my heart was this weird, they did this roast of him, like or a tribute at the mm-hmm. Aspen comedy festival. Yeah. And there were, then the dudes that they got on, it was like Paul Rodriguez. I think Saget was there and there were like three or four other guys. And I had this weird moment where I realized that you know, he was sort of a marginal character within his own generation of comics. Right. Like he was so you know depressed and, and miserable Truly, apparently. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and like, I, I just had this moment where I realized, oh my God, he's like a lone wolf. Like, he's got, his, like, his peers aren't even, like, they couldn't get anyone else to fly in and, and show some oh, fucking I never love. of that. Right, right. Like, the, the older guys. Right. We're like... the dudes of his generation. Then he started to realize you never see him on the roast or anything, that he must have been this, this lone fucking wolf out there just with his own misery. Yeah, yeah. And that thing Carl LeBeau said was, uh, that's the best thing I ever heard was, uh, you know, I had LeBeau in here. And Rodney, you know, took a liking to Kennison, you know, and sure. LeBeau was uh, sure. you know, Sam's best friend. And uh, I remember Rodney used to call Kennison when he, this is before he was on medication, because I think the last decade of his life he was medicated. And I think he had some peace. But uh, but apparently he like Kennison had been up for two days and, you know, was doing the Kennison thing, yeah. and, like just sitting there. Bleh. And uh, and Rodney walked in and said, oh, look at little Nero. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ron is. He's fucking. He's just shocked, seen it dude. all. He's just seen it all. I remember, like, I'm always amazed at guys. <laughs> it's not. A, I don't know if it's admirable or not. But because uh, I qu- quit drugs when I was ten or some fucking thing, I got scared immediately. You know what I mean? This a guy. Ten? What drug did you do? That, uh, <laughs> no, I'm exaggerating. But yeah. when I was very, very young, I got very frightened very yeah. quickly. And uh, but I'm always like, holy. With, with those old guys, I go, Jesus yeah. Christ! Yeah, like how many you you went through all those uh, coke uh, where you think you're going to die and shit, yeah. and you're still doing it. Yeah, like, it, was, it was always amazing. With him, yeah, he had a hell of a constitution to, to put fuck. himself through that. Well, I remember Saget told me <laughs> one time. Fucking remember when he had a he had a heart attack and a brain fucking aneurysm at the same time or something. He was in the hospital. Yeah, and he just left. You know. <laughs> Uh, Pulled the thing out. Yeah, and he fuck just it. fucking went to the comic club. So Saget said he walked in. This was two days earlier. He had been in this major operation. And he said uh, he saw <laughs> he saw um, uh, Rodney with two like uh, hookers, you know. And uh, Rodney was waiting for Ron Jeremy to show up. <laughs> this was two days after the. And he's so like that, seventy. And he's seventy. <laughs> so then yes. Saget said to him, he said, uh, Rodney. He goes, how 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 are you how are you doing? And he said, Rodney said to him, how am I doing? He goes, I'm with, I'm with two whores. I'm waiting for a guy who can suck his own dick. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> 
What a fucking classic, man. <laughs> I know, man. I got One it. of the fucking kind. Like, when I think of, like, because everybody else, you know, asks you who the best comics are and everything, yeah. and of course your mind always goes to Pryor and, yeah. and those guys. But uh, you always forget about Rodney. Well, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I was reading the My Favorite Joke section of the Parade magazine. It used to come in the Sunday supplement, and they used to have this last page. It was just comedians' jokes. Uh-huh. And I remember reading his, and I, I still remember, you know, uh, you know, some of those jokes uh, what was it like the one that I never for, for some reason sticks out in my mind he's like I get no respect I woke up this morning you know I got out of bed I put my hand on the bathroom door the knob fell off I picked up <laughs> yeah, I put on the faucet the faucet handle for, uh, fell off I gotta tell you I was afraid to go to the bathroom you know, yeah, <laughs> I mean you know where it's gonna go yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but reading that stuff and realizing <laughs> that people actually wrote those jokes and like in, uh, for yeah. a guy like that does I jokes I think he wrote them right yeah, yeah 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 well I think that like he probably I think that he had a you know people would have give him jokes uh-huh, right, I mean right, I, right. It, what a vet it's like, you know, when these guys get famous, then every joke is attributed. Yeah. yeah. Like, like Groucho Marx. I'm yeah. sure if I can... Yeah, that happens all the time, yeah. though. Did you have that feeling or like... Or Yogi Berra, like every retarded yeah. thing everyone ever says, they just say it was Yogi Berra. Well, there used to be something that bothered me about this idea that even... There, there's a blind side to even very intelligent people when they watch, you know, Stewart or, or Bill Maher or anybody on TV, Dennis Miller. They're like, you know, like, it's amazing, all his jokes. How does he write all his jokes? It's like, he doesn't. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you know, and he, like, you know, you, I, I, there was some part of me when the writer strike hit where I'm like, I felt like... they're now now they're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> the cat's out of the bag. Right, right. Who's going to write their own jokes now? I don't know what that, that would be interesting to just have the guys write their own stuff. Well, I think a lot of them can, and I and I don't begrudge anyone to have writers because I think when you get to a level, like, I mean, you obviously, when you did update, people wrote jokes for of you. Course, but, yeah. but if you're a, a guy that's got that uh, defined a voice, I mean, it's a gift. And if people can actually write for you, then it's like a beautiful thing. It's pretty kind of easy to write for some. Like, I noticed in sitcoms, which I have no fucking idea. I don't even like them, but I worked on them. Well, you were on one, what, well, you did one for three seasons, right? You had to run, what was it called again? <laughs> Norm Show. <laughs> so it went down with your name on it. <laughs> yeah, that's the bad thing. But, uh, no, I didn't know anything. I didn't want to be in I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Well, did but you? Did I did. You... I, the only thing I said is, well, Seinfeld has a sitcom. I think I can act as good as Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> That's how you got it. And he had the biggest sitcom in the world. Yeah. And I go, because well, I never thought, you know, I mean, I can't act, but I, you know, I, I surrounded myself with actors and it was okay. But, uh, but man, when I started writing sitcoms, because when you come from stand up, yeah. where the fucking joke has to be good, yeah. I started writing, I wrote on Roseanne. And I remember, I'd look at the script, i go, holy fucking, it's gonna, the whole thing's gonna bomb. Yeah. Everybody's gonna be booing. You, the jokes were so bad. The jokes were so shit. <laughs> because, you know, a stand up, it's so yeah. fucking hard to get yeah. a joke together. Yeah. And they're going, nah, nah, it'll work. And then, of course, it works because they lather up the audience. And, and they love those characters. And they love the characters. Yeah. 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 And that's the, that's also the thing about, People that can create a, a sitcom, they create characters and everything like that. Yeah. Then you can go on and write. It's very easy to write characters that are already. Written. I think sitcoms are all about the relationships bef- between the characters. People are gravitate towards the emotional dynamic of an ensemble, and it's not. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with jokes. They don't got no point. Jo- like you watch the honeymooners, they got no jokes at all. No, you just love those. A couple people. of fat jokes. Yeah. But other yeah. Than that. You just want to see Art Carney and, yeah. and uh, Jack Gleason. <laughs> yeah. But I remember on my show, I go, "Can't we think up some fucking situations? Like it's supposed to be a situation comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And a situation." Situation you're coming up with is I'm dating a girl. That's his fucking. That's the funny <laughs> situation. Because you know, I said I, I remember fucking reading like you could read a thing of the honeymooners and fucking be smiling. You go, uh, Ralph thinks he's a millionaire. You go, Fuck, this is gonna be funny. <laughs> but then it's like, uh, then it's like uh, you know, uh, on Friends, it's like. Jennifer thinks she might have feelings for Matt. You know, yeah, that's what the yeah. fuck is yeah. funny about that. Yeah. So uh, okay, so what happened to the sports show? That did that that hit you pretty hard. No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I tried to structure a question in a sensitive way. It didn't hit me hard. It didn't. No. no. <laughs> what? Because I, I never expect success. I mean, you no. don't. No, never. No, no. Just, but you know, but you can always go back to stand up. And are you well, doing... that's my my luck. My but you flip. were out of that. Were you did you stop for a while doing stand up? No, I always did it. I mean, I did less of it, but I would always. I, you know, because especially when you're doing shit that you don't like, yeah. it's it's good to go on the road and because uh, you have con- con- complete control of that thing. Yeah, and you can be funny. Yeah, you know, and you yeah, know, and it's you all know. on your terms, and yeah. you know, you live or die by what. Because uh, it is a very odd experience to be saying to be being not funny in front of a crowd that is laughing hard at your fucking not funny shit. You know Which that. Which is sitcom. You feel that. Holy fuck, man! It's like you're in a fucking nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> 
You're like, what is going on here? Like, that didn't fucking, that wasn't funny. And they just wait till you stop talking. Yeah. And then they laugh because they're participants, these fucking audiences. Yeah, they're, they're doing their part. They're doing their part, right. It, and, no, you know, that's what I loved about Saturday Night Live is they could fucking, things could bomb. Like, really, only Saturday Night Live and the early Letterman, uh, you could see people fucking bomb. Oh, yeah. No laughs. And there's no other place on TV. Every other place, every every joke works. It's, a, it's an amazing moment. Even when you watch old Dick Cavett shows, like, and that was a popular show, and you're watching, if you watch him now, the audience almost does nothing. Yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah. He'll get a joke off, and he's like, eh. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. And you're like, oh right, my god! Right. Because people didn't have the same expectations that they do now. These fucking people who run the, uh, the who run TV right. made it like this. Right. That you know, there's something about you can be funny without there being a ridiculous moronic joke every fucking thirty seconds. You know, people right. can can accept people just being people for a minute. Sure. There's that horrible. Well, fear I, I wish talk shows would. Maybe you can do it or something. But the, uh, you know, Carson, you'd never see the audience. No, you, know? you never see the audience. Now and you he, see. And he listened to now people. Now the audiences. I oh, yeah, maybe, they're, they're out touching the audience. Yeah. I mean, that was the first thing that I noticed about Jay, and I've never done a show, and right. I got no beef with him. I just don't right. watch the show. But right. all of a sudden, he's out there touching people, and I'm right. like, what's he doing? That's bizarre. Wait, wait, is, it, is this a zoo? It's funny, because Letterman and Leno do that, and really, the guy who... Letterman did, doesn't touch him. Well, but I mean, they're there. They're like, he's... You yeah, know but what that's I mean? a theater. It feels like a real thing. It is, but it's not completely separate, like on late night. Right. Uh, but, uh... Where they're up in a little pen, like yeah, right, on, exactly. on the old Conan show. Exactly. Where's right. the audience? They're up there in the right. pen, right. six feet up, and they're just yeah. sitting back there in a box. And just talking about it now, I think probably the guy who uh, changed it and did it the best was uh, f- fucking Arsenio. He was the real guy that could. I, I guarantee go there. you, that's the only time this is being said in this country <laughs> right now. No, but he, you know, Leno is like so uncomfortable yeah. slapping people's hands. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, this guy was the genius at doing the monologue that were, I don't even remember jokes. I think he'd just do topics. Yeah, he, he just, would just talk. He, he was just not say a, anything. He was not about saving a, a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the audience, I mean, he, the audience in that show was so uh, into the, so a part of the show, you know. So now, what happened with the sports show? Oh, I don't know. It was just, uh, it was on Comedy Central, and I, you know. I, I watched it. It was funny, and I, was I'm not right. a sports guy. Yeah, it was all right. But you're funny. It was, <laughs> that's nice, Mark. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, because I think it was, I don't know, I don't really give a fuck, but it was. I you think, really don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about it too much. Okay. But uh, the, the, <laughs> it's funny because people think I should. Like when I got fired, from, I still get asked about SNL. Thank, thanks for not asking me about it. I don't know why now I just brought it up. But when I got fired from SNL, people still ask me like, ah, fuck, don't you hate that guy? I go, I don't fucking, what? No, he was the, he didn't think I was funny. I get it. I understand. And also, there's so much politics involved in that bullshit. I got actually a weird question yeah. and, and I don't know if you can answer it for me, but I'm obsessed with it and I, and I discuss it with the people that have been uh-huh. on SNL, but, but you come into it specifically. <clears throat> there, before you got fired, there was a point there where you were negotiating and you, you might not go back to the show, correct? No. There wasn't ever a point where you were sort of like, you know, not deciding whether or not you were going to renew your contract? No, me? No. No. Oh. Why? Why, why? Well, no, because they brought me in. You they, know, I, they? like I met with Lauren. I did the whole, I jumped. What? Through, uh, yeah. I jumped <laughs> through all the hoops. Really? I was, I was the, the. You were the guy. But what I, but like what I understood later, I just, I, I didn't get it, obviously. Yeah. And uh, it went nowhere. Oh, you would have been good. You would have been good. Right. But I, like someone came up to me, a fucking writer. Who I don't remember his name, but he had written. He was like a. He was on the beat back then. Uh-huh. I can't remember his name, but like after you know, after I went through all that, you know, he came up to me and said, "Yeah, they were just trying to to pressure Norm." Oh no, that's not true. Oh good, because I told uh, I told Lauren at one point I'd do it forever. I said, "What if I was like Walter Cronkite?" <laughs> I won't ask for much money. I'll just fucking just I'll do it till I'm 65. And he's like, "What?" Yeah, but uh, no, that couldn't have been it. But it could have been. It was probably. They were getting ready to uh, to get rid of me because they always pretended it was Don Olmeyer, but I think it was. I don't think that's true. You just think it was in house. I think it was every yeah everybody what? because because uh, it was a particular thing where we had uh, um, a lot of autonomy on update. Well, this was and they tried to tie it to OJ and everything else. Yeah, they did that. But and I don't and it. what do you think? Well, so you just think it was a business decision? I think well, yeah. I think it was uh, that uh, we had a lot of autonomy on update, which didn't make the other people feel very happy. It was like the news division <laughs> it was in, like in that. network. Yeah, it was. Don't touch my yeah, news you're division. Right. Yeah. It was like that. And we had Jim Downey. Yeah. Uh, it was me and Jim, and Jim was was very. Lauren was a little like, uh, um, you know, rightfully. Uh, 
respective of, of Jim and we're yeah. going to let Jim uh, on his own. So anyways, um, I, I think the whole show is tired of me uh, not taking marching orders. Oh, really? I think so. Like Lauren would, uh, Lauren hints at things. Like he would go like, I don't know if you really, because I do Michael Jackson jokes or something, because I don't really know if you want Michael Jackson to, you want a lawsuit by Michael Jackson. Oh, he's suggesting. Passive and and then I go, that's cool. I, I'm like a retard. I'm just answering his question. I go, that'd be fucking cool. Michael Jackson suing me and I'm in court with him and shit. <laughs> and then he's like, oh. like so I, he, I would never get his stuff till later. And then I go, oh yeah. That's a, so he would say basically in, in a slightly uh, passive aggressive way, maybe you shouldn't do that you would and i'm such a retard <laughs> that passive aggression does not work on me i need aggression what's well, that innuendo thing you have a problem with it's yeah like, can't you just say I, don't do that i seriously I, I keep missing it yeah and i wish the guy would just go don't do it and then i wouldn't do it you yeah know what i mean but he he says he suggests things and i go okay fuck it <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious so are you working on something now i mostly do stand up i mean there's always like uh there's always like you're not hosting the poker thing anymore. Retarded thing. Oh, the, po the poker. <laughs> no, I do. I don't know. Poker is illegal now, so I'm not sure. It's illegal. It's yeah. They shut down all the sites. So, so. Uh, so how you doing with that thing? <laughs> what, oh, <laughs> the, the gambling thing. Ah, fuck, man. Yeah. Gambling is a. Uh, I don't know. You know, I kind of uh, like I went broke like a few times when I actually had lots of money. Gambling. Three times. Gambling. With gambling, yeah. yeah, and I mean broke, dead broke, like, uh, and um, so would you call yourself a degenerate gambler? Well, I don't. Degenerate has a uh, epithet, <laughs> negative kind connotation. Of connotation, yeah, <laughs> but uh, certainly compulsive, <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. but um, I don't know what it was. I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I do know this: when I would go broke, because they say gamblers want to lose and stuff, yeah. which always seemed odd to me. But I will say the three times that I went broke for a lot of money. I had a very freeing feeling. You know, I would go to the coffee shop and have a coffee yeah, and yeah, have yeah. nothing. And yeah. I, I, a, lot, a lot of me is um, trying to get the fuck as ascetic as I can in my life. Oh, really? So it was a Zen fuck thing? That. This was like a, you would recommend, if you wrote a book on Zen, it would be like, go out, <laughs> make a bunch of stupid bets, <laughs> yeah. lose everything, and enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> Zen and the art of being a retard. The uh, but I, I I not because it's, it bring, would bring me peace of mind or anything, but because every every uh, my when I in a, I bought a house for yeah. the first time ever. Yeah, and it was like I was walling myself into a fucking mausoleum or something. I'm yeah. all of a sudden I'm like, when you had money, fuck yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be here. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want a bunch of stuff to have to fucking mostly because I'm lazy. I yeah. guess I don't want to have a fucking footstool because then I have to clean it. I right. Don't know. Right. I, like no, I, I feel the same way. Possible. Well, it's exhausting because there's no end to uh, you, you. You become tethered to it and you worry about it. Yeah. You got a house. It's like, who's going to fix that light? Right. Do I got to call a guy? I Do it. I got to hire a guy to call the guy? And yeah. I'm sure you know, and I know guys, because we're not rich, but we know rich guys yeah. that have fucking massive houses and, and shit. And you go, fuck, it seems like a nightmare. Well, then you know what I realized? I just realized it two days ago. I can't. I got a two bedroom house here. And if you notice, when he went to pee, that second bedroom just got a bed in my girl girlfriend shitting it all over the floor and 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 the fact that there's nothing in there every day it's like a curse i walk by that room and i'm like i don't know what to do with that room like you know like i'm worried um, i think that my entire house like i got i found a little termite damage that looked like 50 years old i'm like is there even wood underneath this stucco or is it just sort of like brittle i don't know what's anyways are you uh, do you rent no, I own this fucking yeah. this, like place. I think if you rent, you can move. I think that's of a, course, yeah, a great of course. Thing but about I, you renting. know, I bought yeah, I bought a house. Like I bought this thing. It's Everybody in, told me to buy. Right, I bought. It's, it was built in 1924, and you're like, but that's nice, is it? I don't know. <laughs> even, like the floor is not insulated. It's a fucking oven in there when it's hot, and when it's cold, I feel like I'm living in a refrigerator. I just had a rat die under my house for three days, and but that's the kind of person I am. Like the rat's sitting under their dead. I know there's a dead thing yeah. under there, but I don't want to fucking crawl under there yeah. and get this dead thing. So I'm like, I'll write it out. Out. How long could it take for it to completely <laughs> decompose? I can live in this shitty smell. And then, then, then eventually you know, I call my gardener and I'm like, do you know a guy? They say, oh, I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, my God. And you know, for 50 bucks, he climbs under there. He pulls his fucking rat out. And I'm like, it takes 60. I, I don't know. Like, I'm, a, I'm a sport. Here's $10 yeah, burn, more yeah. for taking 20 minutes to do something I'm too much of a pussy to do. <laughs> but uh, but I, but what I realized two days ago yeah. was that if you're making $20 million a year, mm -hmm. 
to pay a guy a hundred thousand dollars to watch your car is, is nothing. You know, <laughs> to pay is, a guy right. sixty thousand dollars a year to cook every fucking meal for you and, and spoon feed it, which they'll do for sixty thousand dollars, is meaningless. So I think it's really about that. It's like, but I don't have a mind that works like that. I want to be part. Of, I want to do it all myself. Uh, yeah, I'll hire a Mexican guy to, to go into my house. Sure, and, but I'll feel bad about it. I give right. him some water. You, you know, but but if you have enough money. To, to not give a shit and just pay people yeah. to wipe your ass for you, that you've earned it. I guess that's your big payoff. But for you, I don't know that you could live with that. No, I, I, I that wouldn't be fun for me. <laughs> what was the biggest bet you ever made? Oh God Almighty! Um, I don't know. I, I one time, I, I, I mean, the most I lost in one night where because three times I've lost everything that I've ever had. How do you do that? I mean, not, not morally, but I mean like. How, how do you physically want, do it? Well, yeah, I mean, like you know, you you like you make one more. Like, what is the process of that? What's the evolution? It's it, funny because it's a, a the only time I ever went to a psychiatrist, he said like I was like because it was for gambling. I'm yeah. like, how the fuck do I get out of this? And he's like, oh, you gamble to avoid uh, life, you know. And I'm like, but my 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 thing was, well, isn't that why you do f everything in life is to <laughs> fucking avoid us? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's I too painful. Yeah, like, <laughs> why, why do you? So I said, uh, but oh, it's painful to think about, but because uh, um, because now it would be nice to have the money, but um, you just lose it by uh, by it's just like any escape, I guess. Because I was never a drug or alcohol guy, but like when I watch a game and I have a bunch of money on it, then I can understand what's going on. Nothing's ambivalent or anything about it, you know. And there's and there's stakes. There's stakes. You know exactly the rules. Yeah, you're completely involved, and you're completely escaped from your life. Yeah, of the of the real, yeah. the real, um, the real fear. You know, I'd, I'd rather fear losing money in a football game than uh, ruminate all fucking night about uh, about my upcoming uh, show illness. Yeah, and death. Oh, oh, that. Yeah, no, not my show. No, my biggest problem is ruminating about death. If I could get over that somehow. And you do that regularly? I try to. I read fucking books about it and shit. Have you read that Becker book? Uh... Denial of Death. Oh, yeah? You yeah, it's book? my favorite book in the world. Oh, it is? Yeah, I, I have both. I have all his books. That's I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting his newsletter. <laughs> and he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. <laughs> the Becker right. Foundation. It's helped me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, th well, that's uh, the whole idea of that is the, the transference thing, that, you know, you know, to feel part of something bigger than yourself to right. define your life, and you can do with that what you want. I mean, it's better if it's God than gambling, I think, in some God ways. is the best. Yeah. So I mean, what, I, 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 that's what I'm trying to get to is God. Well, let's go, like, let's get, let's get, let's, get, let's get, get to God piecemeal. So, like, you still haven't walked me through losing everything. <laughs> well, um, how you do it? Physically? Yeah, because, like, I mean, because, like, you know, you've got a house, you've, you had a lot of money saved up, and, you, and, and, and then, like, so you make one bet, and then you realize you're, you're about to lose everything. Do you make phone calls to people saying, like, I just need a little more? I mean, well, you know, you kind of, at the end of it, you know, uh, it's happening. It's. I guess it's like I've. I've never had substance abuse problems, but I guess it's like people that um, know they're going to hit bottom, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of want it. Yeah. Because it does get. It, it, it's exhausting. Yeah. To be obsessed with something. Right. So um, you are, I guess, um, trying to do it, trying to finish it off. Right. Finally. Right. Because if you if you have four hundred fifty thousand in the bank, yeah. whatever the fuck it was, and then you lose four hundred thousand, you go fuck it. I don't want the fucking have 50,000 right <laughs> to remind me that I don't want money to remind me that I have I more money that. <laughs> so that's how you do it so that's how you do it yeah. and you did that three times three times in my life yeah and and how long have you been off it um I've been off it like five five years or so yeah and you're trying to get to some spirituality in your life I'm trying to because all I uh the only real joy I get uh, other than I love watching comedy, but uh, anything deeper than that is I uh, read a lot of literature and stuff. I'm not uh, I'm not educated like I never had any schooling, uh -huh. and I don't read nonfiction much, but I read lots of literature. Uh -huh. And um, like who? Uh, Tolstoy. Oh yeah, yeah. Faulkner. But the um, faith keeps coming up, and yeah. I'm like these motherfuckers are smart. Yeah, I mean you know. Like, I was always like, you know, uh, Pryor's this fucking most deep, profound guy I yeah. ever fucking heard, you know, yeah. from my limited perspective. Now, all of a sudden, I'm reading books. I'm like, holy fuck. 
this guy knows everything. Like, yeah. I was reading Tolstoy. I was like, fuck, one word, yeah. one sentence, this guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but then I was like, why are all these guys, uh, it all comes down to faith. You know, it seems to every fucking great novel I read, it seems like faith is the, the only um, um, salvation. Yeah. So, but I don't know how to get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I don't know how to just suddenly believe. Or surrender. Like, yeah, I don't know yeah. how to do that. I'm not... I'm too, I don't know, I'm too uh, stupid or proud or pretend I'm smart or whatever. Or afraid. Probably afraid, yeah. Yeah, to sur- it's, yeah it's a surrender. It's hard. It's it's like this equation that your brain has to do where you realize that you have very little control over anything. That yes. that moment where you realize, like, you know, just about all of it is out of my control. Yeah. And it, it, there's only two things you can do in that moment, which is either I'm fucked or yeah. <laughs> it's okay. And and yeah. how you support it's okay is with some kind of faith. I guess, yeah. I I, I guess I've come to it a long time ago that I have no control over anything. But I, I <clears throat> I've been struggling with faith. I'll just throw myself into um, religion sometimes. But the problems with that is, uh, then you get into churches and stuff, and then you get into men and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And and then you go. Oh, it's it's very easy to fall into the trap of going like religion's bad. I mean, I mean God's bad because this fucking pr- priest fucked a kid, which yeah. is retarded. You know right. what I mean? Why does that make God bad? Doesn't right. make any fucking sense. It just means the people that represent him. Are yeah, 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 yeah. Questionable. So, so um, you know, so then if you go into any church, obviously it's led by fallible men, and uh, you, you can't believe in them. So you got to kind of come, you know, come to it yourself somehow. But I really I don't have the answer of how you do that or anything. Where are you at with it now? I don't know. I, the only thing I've ever explored is, is Christianity. I, you know, and that kind of I liked it. Yeah, but it's just extremely hard to to keep believing. It's really fucking hard. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because yeah. uh, it's the hardest thing to believe, and I think I'm not deep enough. I don't know if that's true. I I, I think that you know j- just by nature of the fact that you're a comedian and that part of the way you understand things is by cutting through bullshit. Uh-huh. You know, with jokes. I mean, especially you. I mean, you cut through bullshit. I mean, you know, you call bullshit on just about anything, you know, very concisely and in a very funny way. That when you're sitting here trying to sort of like y- you stay uh, in in a place of faith into the you know the you know the sort of the Jesus thing and the you know the, and, and whatever you're choosing to hang that faith on, there's going to be part of you that thinks like. That's just bullshit. There is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's specific like that. Yeah. But then I don't want to be a fucking idiot that goes like, you know, sometimes you meet people, they're like, I'm spiritual. You're like, what? Yeah. They're like, I have my own thing. Yeah. I'm like, you, why don't you work at Burger King? You figured out a fucking whole thing by yourself? Yeah, well, they, <laughs> they, they, they've got their own thing that enables them to work at Burger King without hanging themselves. <laughs> That's a pretty powerful yeah, guy. Yeah, I don't want to... <laughs> I, I'm not going to certainly, if I'm not going to accept Christianity, I'm not going to accept some fucking 17 year old girl's fucking idea. Well, maybe you should just get a job at Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the humility of that will will, uh, will shed a little light. It's like, because it, it's exactly the same feeling I think you probably had when uh, when you had to deal with the blind guy. That, you know, there's something, you know, outside of you. There's there's bigger struggles that are had by many people, and they they seem to survive. I've actually thrive. thought about working with blind people because because I look back on that time, and it really it was the first time you really look outside yourself. It's pretty incredible the things that you observe, even as a, a writer or anything. I think it would be incredibly important. Well, I think that's important for like a, a spiritual thing too, is to not think about yourself first. Yeah, I think most spiritual people, I, I ego, you're exactly right. Yeah, and but I think a lot of people go, that's the way to find it is to look inside yourself. But I think you're right. I think it's not. It's to look outside. It's a, it's to try to get past your ego. Yeah, to to get that thing hammered down to to almost nothing to where you you actually think about the better of somebody else over yourself yeah and that's Holy very fuck i would never be able to do that right well that's very contrary to like there's this other whole movement now the positive thinking people oh, yeah. Yeah, all you gotta do is throw that switch man <laughs> everything's okay <laughs> hey don't be negative <laughs> I, I fucking can't deal with that shit but you got but you can see in acting or in comedy that that works i know 
like the person that goes, "Hey, man, I'm cool. Everything's gonna be good," and it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's like it's it's horrendous. But is it really? I mean, just because you're denying your flaws and you know everything else, I mean, you can sort of fake it till you make it. Or there's a lot of slogans, "Act as if," whatever yeah. it is. But but still, it's like you know they say that eventually this will just kick in in earnest. Yeah. yeah, until one day you're like, it's not kicking in, yeah, and this yeah, is yeah. fucked up, and you guys misled me, and fuck all of you. Right. The truth is, it's dark and horrible, and we die alone. Fuck you guys. <laughs> the, yeah, the, 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 what is it called? If, what? Act as if. Act as if. I, I guess I understand what that would mean, yeah. Sure. But act as if, yeah, but all these books and all these things, you know, the bowel cancer hasn't read the book. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? They don't read anything. They're they fucking cancers. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 whenever someone, like, you know, people start talking about organs, I fucking check out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can handle a lot of dark shit, you know, I can fulfill my head with stuff, but when people start saying, like, I had kidney failure, I'm like, oh, God. Oh, no. Nothing. Yeah. That's why those fucking, the scariest movies always to me were the, like the Cronenberg movies, because oh. it was always the inside. I, yeah, I was, I, was, I was thinking about The Fly recently. Yeah. I, like, <laughs> Or that moment where it's like when he's climbing up the wall and he's like, pretty weird, huh? Yeah. He's like, oh, God. No, and then, awesome. and then when he breaks apart and there's a giant fly inside of him. Can we turn this around somehow to end this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like my act when I do my act. Yeah. I never think of a fucking ending. Yeah. Like I just a, trickle like off. Return, just yeah. fucking. Me too. Just I, unravel. I guess this yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> it's we terrible. good? You done? It's terrible. You guys feel okay with the, what happened here? Every week I go, why didn't I think of something? Do you do that thing where you look, it's like, okay, I've done an hour and 15, and uh, I don't know that, uh, you know, how it's structured really matters. I'm done. <laughs> That's I'm what I'm like. I, <laughs> and then I know people are kind of silent. They're like, but where's the big What's the matter with him? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're doing okay, man. I really. Oh, have... yeah. Well, I'm glad you are, man. This is awesome. This is so. Sorry it's so hot. It's so cool. It is hot. But it's cool you got this thing uh, that's your own and you don't have to um, listen to. Uh, yeah, no one can really tell me what to do ear. except bad Mark. I talked to Bob Costas, you know, and uh, he does. Ba you're not a, a sports fan, but yeah, I like does, him. He's all right. He's great, but he yeah. does baseball. These fucking baseball guys know everything. And it was after I got fired and shit. And he said, "Oh fuck!" He goes, "I know how it is." He goes, "I got people in my ear. These producers telling me." I'm like, you do? Like, he calls baseball games. Yeah. Even he's got fucking guys like, they say this, you know? Yeah. Really? Yeah, he says people are saying it in his ears, and he's like, it's always nonsense shit, you know? Yeah. So it's nice that you have a place where a, a guy doesn't go, uh, hey, uh, yeah. ask him this. No, it's it's. Uh, it, I'm very uh, grateful that it's working out, and I love doing it, but I, I do have a guy within me that says, like, oh, the other food's going to drop, dude. <laughs> oh, well, that's yeah, right, yeah. yeah. but, but thing, But something is going to happen. <laughs> Thanks, That's Norm. That's bad part. <laughs> All right. Let's weave it there. <laughs> okay. Love you, buddy. Love you too, man. <laughs> oh, my God. What a great conversation. Completely surprised. You guys, Norm MacDonald. Sweet, thoughtful, reflective. I I had no idea. I, I, I loved that conversation. I really did. Oh, man. That was fun. Great guy. Anyways, that's our show. I am Mark Marin. Why am I doing that now? I already do that at the beginning. Hey, look, go to WTFPod.com. Please get on the mailing list. If you want to kick in a donation, we got uh, shirts. You know, if you do the $10 a month thing, you get a shirt, you get some stickers, you get my my uh, unconditional love. If you do the $250, you know, one-time donation, you'll get three CDs, a couple of shirts, some stickers, my you know double unconditional love. But you can also just go to WTFPod.com. we got new videos. you got links to the YouTube page that we got now. You can see the entire episode catalog. You can get the app.